The Arizona Diamondbacks are still the latest expansion team in the National League with their inaugural season in 1998, and to this day, they are still the fastest expansion team to win a World Series. So let's look at how they went from an abysmal first year of existence to World Series champions in just four years. Totally sports-esque. Major League. Baseball in Arizona prior to the 1990s was a lot like the cities currently vying for an expansion team. There was a rich history, especially in the amateur leagues, and great support of a minor league team with the notable Phoenix Firebirds, who are the AAA affiliate of the Giants. And of course, given the weather in Arizona, it was a natural spot for spring training. The first serious attempt for an Arizona team came in the 80s when Martin Stone, the owner of the Phoenix Firebirds, approached Bill Bidwill, who owned the Cardinals football team, then located in St. Louis, about sharing a 70,000 seat dome stadium as the Cardinals were taking their talents through the desert. But Bidwill opted to sign a long-term lease with Arizona State to use their stadium, which ended the bid. But the next bid didn't take long to come about. In 1993, Jerry Colangelo, majority owner of the Suns, announced he was assembling an ownership group to apply for an MLB team called Arizona Baseball Incorporated, similar to the groups Nashville, Portland, and Salt Lake City have formed. And the group was so confident that they would secure a team that they held a Name the Team contest in February of 1995, with the winning entry getting lifetime season tickets. Sorry if I spoiled this for you, but the winning name ended up being the Diamondbacks, with the Coyotes, Rattles, Scorpions, and Phoenix right behind. The bid was supported by Bud Selig and Michael Jordan's best friend, Jerry Krause, with plans to build a giant warehouse where baseball could also be played in the middle of the worker shifts. In just one month after the name contest, Arizona was awarded an MLB team. Wanting to market the team to the entire state, Colangelo decided to go with the Arizona Diamondbacks instead of the Phoenix Diamondbacks, though half of the state was already retired Yankee fans anyway. The Diamondbacks were originally set to join the American League, along with the other expansion teams set to join the league in 1998, known as the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. But with multiple teams in the American League concerned about losing revenue and TV ratings because of a time difference, the plan fell through, and the Diamondbacks went to the NL, while the Devil Rays went to the AL. And since neither of these teams had players, 1997 brought an expansion draft. Just like the expansion draft in 1992, both teams were set to select 35 players, with the ability to pick any player on other teams that weren't on protected list. The Devil Rays won the coin toss and picked Tony Saunders first, who would be gone by 1999 after injuries. The Diamondbacks got the next two picks and selected Brian Anderson and Jeff Supon, with Supon not even playing a full season with them. The two teams then alternated picks the rest of the way, and in the end, the Diamondbacks would only select two future All-Stars in Tony Batista and Damian Miller, with Miller being the only one of the two to make the All-Star team while on the Diamondbacks. Both teams traded a few of their picks as expected, and the Diamondbacks traded for Matt Williams and signed Jay Bell to a five-year contract. After decades of possibility and years of serious bidding and marketing, the Arizona Diamondbacks were set to play their first game on March 31st, 1998, with Buck Showalter as manager and Andy Bennis on the mound in Game 1 against another recent expansion team, the Colorado Rockies. Travis Lee hit the first home run for the Diamondbacks in the sixth inning, but they were already down and ended up losing 9-2. And game 2 wasn't much better, and neither was Game 3, or Game 4, or Game 5. But game 6 brought their first franchise win over the Giants. But those first two series were a sign of things to come, as they had a terrible first year to be expected, as they had one all-star in Devin White and finished last in the NL West at 65-97, and which is actually the fifth best record of the 14 expansion teams in their first year in MLB history, with the 1961 Angels being the only team to win 70 games. While the Devil Rays and Diamondbacks had nearly the same record in the first year, the 1999 offseason would show the different directions the team went in. The Devil Rays continued to add more veterans as they had with Wade Boggs by signing Jose Canseco to add another to the list of old players who look weird in certain uniforms and may drive in some new fans. The Diamondbacks, on the other hand, as they intended from the beginning, proved they weren't afraid to spend money, and they made arguably the biggest move in franchise history by signing Randy Johnson to a four-year, $52.4 million contract. And that move paid off big time, as in his first year on the team, he became the third pitcher to win the Cy Young in the AL and the NL. And funny enough, Pedro Martinez accomplished the same feat that same year. Johnson compiled a 2.48 ERA while pitching the most innings in the league, and leading the league with 364 strikeouts in 12 complete games. His efforts were huge as in one of the more drastic turnarounds, the Diamondbacks won 100 games to win the NL West by 14 games. While they only had one All-Star last year, they had four in 1999, with Jay Bell and Matt Williams starting the game, while Randy Johnson pitched in relief, while Luis Gonzalez was a reserve, another big offseason addition where they gained in a trade from the Cubs. The Diamondbacks had four players hit over 25 home runs and drive in 100 runners 
giving them a still standing franchise record in hits, runs, average, on base percentage, and slugging percentage. As Matt Williams finished third in MVP voting, J Bell, Randy Johnson, and Luis Gonzalez finished in the top 20. An insane turnaround that made them the only expansion team to make the playoffs in their second year. They faced the Mets in the NLDS and split the first ever playoff games in Arizona then lost Game 3, and in Game 4, things went to the 10th, and after they went down 1-2-3 in the top half, Todd Pratt would hit a drive off Matt Monte, and Steve Finley leaped, and it seemingly went through his glove for a heartbreaking finish to a historic season reminiscent of every Arizona sports team. And coming off that historic year, they were returning a very similar team with the addition of Craig Council. They got off to a great start ending April in first place, while Randy Johnson tied a record by recording six victories in that month. And they had another great month in May, ending one and a half games beyond the Braves for the best record in the league. But over June and July, they finished three games under 500 as Randy Johnson started the All-Star game. They were out of first place at the start of August, and they never regained it, finishing in third place with a record of 85-77, and 77, with obvious drops in team stats after the record year. The highlight of the year came from Randy Johnson winning the Cy Young for the third time and for the second year in a row, making him the third to win consecutive NL Cy Youngs. It was a disappointing year after winning 100 games in the year prior, but it was important for the year to come. On the last day of the season, Buck Showalter was fired, with the team saying they needed a lighter touch compared to the disciplinary and micromanaging approach Showalter had. They ended up hiring Bob Brenly as his replacement, receiving the job over the likes of Clint Hurdle and Terry Francona. But bigger than that, the midway point of the 2000 season brought along the trade of Nelson Figueroa, Travis Lee, Vincente Padilla, and Omar Dahl for Kurt Schilling. Schilling was already a three-time All-Star, and more than that, he was a great postseason pitcher. And though he didn't get the chance in 2000, 2001 would be a different story. They added Mark Grace, Midray Cummings, Reggie Sanders, and Mike Mahler to a team anchored by Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling on the mound, making them one of the favorites to win it all. They didn't get off to the same start as they did in 2000, but they got hot in May and June, going 28-19 to give them a six-game lead in the NL West and the best record in the NL. As Randy Johnson started the All-Star game for the second straight year, with Luis Gonzalez and Kurt Schilling joining him. The team kept winning through August, but the Giants weren't far behind. And after going 10-11 and in a shortened September after delays caused by 9-11, the Giants were within two going into the final week. But after taking four out of six, the Diamondbacks finished with a record of 92-70, and good enough to win their second division title in three years. And for the third straight year, Randy Johnson took home the Cy Young, while Schilling finished in second. In a year where he had a 20 strikeout game and a 16 strikeout game in a delay game he didn't appear in until the third inning, he posted a 2.49 ERA while leading the league in strikeouts, whip, and ERA+. Plus. It should also be noted he was doing this in the midst of the steroid era, making what him and Pedro did in this time even more incredible. And the steroid era is part of the reason Luis Gonzalez didn't win MVP. He had 57 home runs, drove in 142, with a 1.117 OPS and a 7.9 war. In almost any other year, he would have the home run crown and an MVP. But in 2001, Gonzalez finished third in MVP voting and home runs, behind Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds, whose 73 home runs that year is still the record. Despite having multiple MVP candidates, the Diamondbacks still needed to show that they could win the playoffs. And they got their chance against the Cardinals with some rookie named Albert Pools. The two games in Arizona and St. Louis were both split, which brought things to a Game 5. It was a rematch of Game 1 with Matt Morris and Kurt Schilling, who threw a complete game shutout in a 1-0 victory in Game 1. And things were similar in Game 5. The only run through the first seven innings was scored on a Reggie Sanders solo home run in the fourth. But the Cardinals tied things in the eighth by finally getting to Schilling with a J.D. Drew solo home run. Schilling finished the ninth with the game tied at 1, and the Cardinals were in trouble immediately after Matt Williams hit a leadoff double. Midray Cummings pinch ran for Williams after he got to third on a sack bunt. Then on a safety squeeze attempt by Tony Womack, Cummings would get caught at the plate as Greg Colburn went to second. And two years after being eliminated on a walk-off home run, they won their first playoff series on Womack's single after the failed squeeze attempt, an inning that was a telling sign of things to come. The Diamondbacks had the fortune of playing the 2010 Dodgers of the time, known as the 1990s through 2000s Atlanta Braves. Randy Johnson outdueled Greg Maddox in Game 1 with a complete game shutout. Then the Braves took Game 2, but things went to Atlanta, and the Diamondbacks exploded for 16 combined runs in Game 3 and Game 4. And in Game 5, Johnson was on the mound again, and this time he went up against Tom Glavin. 
and he bested him, giving up two runs over seven, while Byung Hung Kim came in for the two-inning save in a 3-2 game to give the Diamondbacks their first pennant in just their fourth year of existence, with their 2000 pickup Craig Council taking home NLCS MVP. And they were set up to face the Yankees in the World Series. On paper, based on talent, it could be easy to see the Diamondbacks as favorites. But these were the Yankees coming off four World Series in five years, having just beaten the team with the greatest regular season record of all time in the ALCS. And they had the emotional connection in the wake of 9-11. So ultimately, a team in their fourth year of existence versus the New York Yankees, especially in this time, is a Nashville David vs. Goliath matchup. For a more detailed look at the series, you can watch my video looking at the three decade span of the 1991, 2001, and 2011 World Series. But to see how impressive this team was, we can just look at Game 6 and 7. Really, this series should have ended in New York, but Tino Martinez hit a two-run home run to die Game 4 in the ninth. then Derek Jeter hit a walk-off home run in an inning later. Then somehow, the same thing happened the next night off the same pitcher. Scott Broches hit a game-tying two-run home run in the ninth. then Alfonso Soriano hit a walk-off single in the 12th. At that point, I don't even know how a team comes back from that, and Destiny seemed to be on the Yankee side, but the Diamondbacks seemed unconcerned and scored 15 in Game 6 to set up a Game 7. The clear representation of that team is seen in this game. Notably, Randy Johnson relieved Kurt Schilling after pitching the night before, but what is most memorable, of course, is the bottom of the ninth. Down a run against the greatest closer of all time seemed unsurmountable, but they chipped away with the Mark Ray single and an error on Damian Miller's bunt. After Jay Bell grounded out, Tony Womack, who hit the walk-off single to win the NLDS, has statistically one of the most clutch hits of all time. His two-out double that tied the game added 50% to the Diamondbacks' championship win probability, the second most of all time on one play. Then the NLCS MVP will get hit by a pitch, and of course, the first player to have his number retired by the Diamondbacks, Luis Gonzalez, would hit a bloop single to win the Diamondbacks their first and only World Series in just their fourth year of existence the fastest in MLB history, and the second fastest in the four major American sports leagues behind the 1971 Milwaukee Bucks. The first four year of the Diamondbacks' existence can be seen as the gold standard for expansion teams in baseball. And prior to the existence of the Vegas Golden Knights, it could be seen as the standard for all sports. Of the many expansion teams, naturally, it takes years to come close to contending. Fans are supposed to just be happy they have a team instead of expecting immediate greatness. And this is especially true in the expansion teams of the 60s and 70s for expanded playoffs brought along by the expansion. While of the four new teams brought along in the 90s, the Diamondbacks by far had the best immediate results. The Diamondbacks had another good season after 2001, going 98-64 and to win the NL West again, though they were swept in the NLDS by the Cardinals. And in those five years, they had a combined record of 440 and 370, winning three division titles and a World Series. In comparing them to the Devil Rays, formed the same year as them, their first five years saw them go 318 and 490, finishing in last place in all those years and never winning more than 70 games, something they wouldn't do until they won 97 in 2008 on their way to the AL pennant. And there were two expansion teams founded five years before them, in the Rockies and the Marlins. And for the Rockies' first five years, they went 333 and 384. It should be noted that the 94-95 season were shortened, and the wild card is the reason they made the playoffs in 95, though they lost in the NLDS. And as for the Marlins, they went 294 and 390 in their first five years, and their fifth year brought 92 wins in a World Series, the fastest expansion championship until the team we spent the video talking about came along. But the Marlins lost 108 games the year after winning the World Series, while the Diamondbacks had another competitive year before a drop-off. So, the early Diamondbacks were anonymously in expansion team history, and they didn't really do it on the back of their original team. As mentioned, only one player in the expansion draft became an all-star on the Diamondbacks in Damian Miller. And in a study by Max Cates, looking at the 14 expansion teams and the impact of their drafts in terms of drafted player performance and the players they were traded for along with team performance, he placed them 11th out of 14. The Diamondbacks went with a different philosophy than other expansion teams in that they used the expansion draft to trade for bigger pieces instead of waiting for development that never came, like the Devil Rays. And the expansion draft is exactly what they use to get three of the biggest pieces in their 2001 run in Matt Williams, Kurt Schilling, and Luis Gonzalez. What was the real X factor was their signings. Jay Bell, Steve Finley, and Mark Grace were very important signings, and none in franchise history was as big as Randy Johnson joining the new team in 1999. That 52 million he was given in his first four years that made him one of the top 10 highest paid players in the league was one of the greatest returns on investment in baseball history. All you have to know is he won four Cy Youngs in those four years, and was ultimately the most important player on this team, 
and the stats back it up in the fact that in just those four years, he had a league-leading war of 38 and added 16.7% to the Diamondbacks' championship win probability and dropped one Burr's life expectancy to zero. The first five years for the Diamondbacks were easily the best first five years an expansion team has ever had, brought along by great front office moves to lose and gain the right pieces, and those pieces reaching their peak in Arizona and stepping up in clutch moments to go against the MLB script in 2001 to win the World Series, and ultimately giving the model for the Guangdong Tigers set to make their MLB debut in 2069. Ni hao! Ni hao! Ni hao!